let me talk about the Torah real quick because, it, first of all, who's reading the Torah portions? Who's reading? You're reading, what book are you reading right now? Numbers, okay? Anyone feel like Numbers is boring? Thank you for your honesty, John. I appreciate it. We're, we're, we're still talking now about Levites and sacrifices and temple service, and, but, but, but what, where we've just arrived into the middle in this Torah portion, this really begins the, some of the most exciting and drama and struggle and heartbreak of the entire Torah. It's a very much a story of real people with real issues trying to learn to live with faith and contentment in their relationship with God. It's, it's a phenomenal look at real life. And so in this portion, Baha Alotcha, it's called, after some discussion of Aaron and the menorah and the Levites, and it's, it's a year and a month after Sinai, and what's Israel doing? Heading out. Going to where? Anyone know? Where was Israel supposed to go when they left Egypt? Israel, Canaan, Eretz Israel, the land. They are finally about to fulfill the promise of God. And you would think they'd be like, oh, wow, let's go. We're finally here. Head down. Let's get this thing done. But we know with our hindsight view, which is so easy to have, because what kind of vision is hindsight vision? Dr. Eisner, 2020, and man, the story gets really good, okay? We sang this song, fire by night, cloud by day. I mean, that's, that's what's happening. How incredibly exciting would that be to have a fire leading you, showing you exactly where you need to be, and you know, how, how convenient don't we all wish that God just still did that with us? Hey, I want you to go here. Okay, got it. That would be incredible. But let's consider what that meant for a minute before, you know, imagining God saying, all right, Cody, pack it up. Time to go. Cody literally is packing it up. It's time to go. They're moving to Macon on Wednesday. So this is for you. And I should also welcome Steve and Amanda from North Carolina, right? Got it. Who drove to Macon to come here. So, Baruch Hashem, safe travels. We're glad to have you. Anyway, did, you, did a cloud or fire bring you here? Okay, well, it would have been cool. Then you definitely would have known you were supposed to be here. But, but think about that. Think about what that actually meant. Not, let, me, let me just read a section of it to you. When the cloud lingered upon the tabernacle many days, the children of Israel would maintain the charge of Hashem and would not journey. Sometimes the cloud would be upon the tabernacle for a number of days, according to the word. They would encamp according to the word of Hashem. They would journey. Sometimes the cloud would remain from evening until morning, and the cloud would be lifted in the morning, and they would journey on for a day and a night, and the cloud would be lifted, and they would journey. Or for two days, or a month, or a year, when the cloud would linger over the tabernacle resting upon it, the children of Israel would encamp and would not journey, but when it was lifted, they would journey. All right. Who wants that life? Who wants to have that kind of required obedience? How many of you would be incredibly good at that? Let me paint the picture for you. All right, guys, settle in, unpack the camp, build the tabernacle, put everything in its place. Psh, next morning, time to go, pack it up. And never knowing, actually. That's why Ramban describes the, the, the intensity, I mean, the, the detail that's in this section of things like that and what they had to pack up. It's to show that it was not easy and they were actually incredibly obedient because if you look, what's missing here is they're complaining about it. We know Israel's is good at complaining about it. They didn't complain one time. They just did it. And I can tell you for certain I would not want to do that, going through the desert. But they did. So, hua for Israel, they did it. 
But why did they demonstrate that kind of obedience? That's a question. Well, I can give you the answer is because they knew where they were going. And at least at this point in the journey, they were willing to do whatever it took to get there. They knew where they were going. That makes a difference. A destination makes a difference. Knowing something good ahead is an incredible attitude builder. Knowing you've got something, knowing that the work of travel for them and teardown was leading somewhere made it worth it. I want to do a scientific study. I'm sure it's been done. I want to do it. It's called the vacation principle. I'm willing to bet that the week before you go on vacation is the most productive week of your work. I am also willing to bet that the week after vacation is the least productive. But you're excited because you know you're going somewhere. You have a destination in mind. And so for Israel, we might call that Israel's BHAG. You know that term? It's a business term coined back in the 90s by Jim Collins, who wrote a great book called From Good to Great. But BHAG is his term. You know what it means? Big, hairy, audacious goal. <laughs> Which is a bit unorthodox to teach Torah using terms like big, hairy, audacious goal, but you're going to remember it. BHAG. This was Israel's thing. It's about where you're going. It's the apex of your life journey. It fires people up. It inspires passion and excitement and motivation. And it puts that look in your eye. When someone talks to you about it and you get the sparkle and the excitement, that's your BHAG. That's the thing. It's something that must be done. It's your dream destination in your life. It drives you to action, to build fortitude, courage, because you want to get where you're going. You have a destination in mind. And I'll tell you a secret. In your life, in your life, you should have a BHAG. You should have a, a destination, a hope, a goal, something you're looking forward to, something you're building in your life, something that matters. Well, my life stinks. Work, eat, sleep, work, eat, sleep. That does stink. That's a terrible life. That's a death sentence. That's not how to live life. You need a destination. You need something worth doing in your life that you're committed to doing. Follow God, that's the first step. Then take a step towards something you want to do, to build, to achieve, have a destination. So Israel set out for the destination. Listen to it. Chapter 10, then it came about, we read this before the Torah service, when the ark set out that Moses said, arise, O Lord, let your enemies be scattered. It's like, man, Moses was pumped too. Everyone was ready. Those who hate you flee from before your presence. They were headed somewhere. Moses, he was ready. We're going to the promised land. We're going to the promised land. But we encounter a problem immediately. First of all, most people don't have a BHAG in their life for one reason. <clears throat> and we learn that in the Torah portion. The header in chapter 11 actually says it all in, in many, you know, in... in in various versions of the Bible, the chapter has a heading because you really need to know what you're about to read. You can't just read it for yourself. They need to tell you. So the header says, the people complain. That's in, that was in chapter 10. Everything I'm telling you, we're going, we're ready, let's do it. Arise, O Lord, let your enemies be scattered. Chapter 11, the people complain. What changed? What changed from... Oh my gosh, we got a destination. Here we go. We're finally going to be moving along so well. Rise up. May your enemies be scattered and then collapse. What happens? You lose your focus. They lost their focus. The focus shifted. They lost the focus on the promise, on the destination, because their attention focus shifted. Not to what God said or what they knew, the glorious end point that they must reach. Instead, and this is the BHAG killer for all of us just about, they start listening to what other people say.
and the focus of who Israel is listening to and following changes. And now a cloud, not a good cloud, a big vision cloud comes over and they can no longer sense their destination. Now the people became like those who complain of adversity in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord heard and his anger was kindled. They were on the final leg of the trip. Do you remember what they were complaining about? Do you know what, what, what they were complaining about? Manna. They were complaining about manna because they missed what? Onions and garlic and whatever else was back in, in I was about to say in Florida, in Egypt. <laughs> they missed, it wasn't that there was no food, they just didn't like the food. So they were complaining. And it all sort of went to hell in a handbasket from here. It's, it's when that happens, it, it, what is the lesson? It's so obvious. The effect of who we listen to, who we surround ourselves with, and what we choose to believe, that will absolutely rob you of some of the greatest rewards if we let that. That is the BHAG killer, the voice of the haters, the complainers, the drag downers. Everybody is vulnerable to it, even Moses. Because as you continue to read in one of my favorite leadership moments, a shining example of Moses' absolute humility and, or, or his, his, his realness is a better word. This is the point in chapter 11 when Moses goes to God and says what? I trust you so much. I know you've got this. Let's roll. I'm with you. He says, if this is it, kill me. What am I supposed to do with these people? Kill me. <laughs> it's incredible. I love it. I love the fact that that's in the Torah. That this is one of the greatest, second only, I would say, to Yeshua, who says this and has this conversation with God. And God says, not literally, but it's like he says, Moses, wake up. Stop. Listen. Who are you listening to? Just stop. Stop. Who are you being influenced by? And, and God says, gather the elders, right? Gather 70 elders. You know, men, like-minded men. Listen to me and, and then tell the people what to say. But Moses isn't done. Like God gives him a directive, says, bring the elders. And Moses says, 600,000 soldiers, where are we going to get meat for that? He's still... Frustrated, he's still got the thoughts running and the voices of the people and he can't hear anything else and he can't see anything else. Where are we going to get that? And that is how quickly, from chapter 10 to 11, how quickly abandon a life purpose or a direction because someone else took it from you. And then there's this little wake-up call. You know, deja vu. You never know if you've actually ever been there before. You don't think you have, but man, deja vu sure makes you feel like you have. This is real deja vu. This, this happened, what I'm about to tell you. God's, God's encounter. In verse 23, God says, after Moses complaining and saying, I can't do this, what's going to happen? How is this going to happen? God says, is the Lord's hand too short? Now you will see whether my word comes to pass or not. Where does that take your mind in the Torah? Is the Lord's hand too short? Now you will see what I'm going to do. Do you know where that is? We've been there before. It's absolutely one of my favorite stories in Torah. It's in Exodus. It's in chapter 5. And it's when this happens. You remember the story, no straw, right? Moses did what God said, and he went into Pharaoh, and he said, let my people go. Let us go out and worship. And what did Pharaoh do? Say, yes, sir. He said, who is this God, and who the heck are you? Take away their straw, no difference in the quota, and the people hated him for it. Moses, they hated him. They said, Mo Moses returned to the Lord, though. After they hated him, he went to the Lord and said, Why have you brought me here? Why have you brought harm to this people? Why did you ever send me? 
Ever since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he's done harm to this people, and you have not rescued your people at all. Moses had the BHAG at that point. He knew what he was supposed to do. Take the people out. I'll go with you. Aaron's going to be with you. You got this staff that's doing this miraculous thing. Go do it. And what happened? The people took it from him because he listened to them. And it's hard not to listen to them when they say, I hate you, I wish you were dead. But God has an answer. Is the Lord's hand too short, he says to Moses there. Now you will see whether my word comes to pass or not, he says. Moses, is my hand too short? You remember my hand, right? He's saying this now to him in numbers. After the 600,000 and this whole thing that's going on, he's saying, is my hand too short? You remember last time I had to remind you of that, Moses? You remember what I did? I did everything I said I was going to do because you did what I told you to do. Don't worry about those people. Do it. And you know what Moses does? He does it. Both times. Moses left and spoke the words of Hashem to the people. This is Numbers 11 now. And he gathered 70 men from among the elders of the people, and he had them stand around the tent. In other words, Moses obeyed. He got back on track. He tuned it out. He closed his eyes. Back on track. Got destination focused. He refocused upward and forward instead of all around here. We all do that. We all lose focus. We all question our circumstances at times. We all get down. But remember the old Japanese proverb I taught you. Fall seven, rise eight. How about one of our proverbs? We have some too. 24, 16 in the book of Proverbs says, For a righteous person falls seven times and rises again but the wicked stumble in disaster. But when we allow this, and I know this is, um, you know, when, when we allow negativity, which, what does negativity usually equal? Negat here's the equation. Negativity equals other people, usually. Usually. Whatever's in your head that's negative so often came from somewhere else. When we lose, the, when we're derailed, these people, even without malicious intent, the world will tell you over and over and over, you can't do it. You can't get there from here. Who are you? That's ridiculous. Behag. Give me a break, man. That's what they tell you. Or they complain. But you see, Moses did something else really, really important. He did what God asked him to do and surrounded himself with 70 elders. We don't, God said, God said bring, bring me 70 elders. Those guys weren't for God. They were for Moses because he knew what Moses needed and Moses may not have, but we don't even know what they said to Moses. All they might have said is, we got your back, man. We're here for you. Sometimes you just got to like, change the company you keep. That, that helps in so many ways. He changed the company. And here's the tough reality, though. Even when God is with you, when the cloud and the fire are leading you and you think everything is just right on, A-OK, -okay, there's probably a test that's coming right around the corner. There's a difference between seeing that as foreboding joy the Brene Brown famous physio, uh, psychological term, foreboding joy. Oh, my son's getting married. What if they get divorced? Oh, I just found out my, my daughter's going to have a baby. What if something happens? That's foreboding joy. You're supposed to just be happy for the moment because inevitably there's a test coming around the corner for you. Inevitably. 
a test that God has probably allowed, at least he knows about it, and he's going to see how you respond. It probably won't have anything to do with you. It's probably, you know, some, some, something for you. The complainers and the tempters and the whiners and your boss and your coworkers and sometimes your spouse or your kids, they're all, you're all going to have this moment where you say, God, I can't do this. Kill me or kill them. <laughs> but the questions in the middle will be the same. God will ask you, is the hand of God too short? And you have to decide if you want to see him say, on the other side of the test, now you will see my word fulfilled. Because we don't get to see those things. And, and listen, tests are everywhere. Right? So Moses, he, he gets this behind him. He gets the 70 elders. All things are great. And then what happens? It's all, it's a shining Example of, of kumbaya life happy, right? No. After 11, what comes next? <coughs> Say it. 12. Thank you, Dave. You're learning. You're learning. <laughs> and after 12, no, just kidding. <laughs> what comes in chapter 12? Happiness, joy, Shangri-La. No! His brother and sister go at him. Now it's not even all these freaks out here complaining about their onions and leeks. Now it's his own brother and sister who are like, who are you, dude? Behag, give me a break. They didn't know what a behag was, but it's part of, the, part of the message. And what happens? Moses goes at him, right? He punches Aaron out, headlocks Miriam, and says, I'm going to give you a noogie, sis. He doesn't do anything. Why? Because this is the section at which Moses is described as the most humble man who ever lived. It says, now, Moses was the most humble man that ever lived. Now, it doesn't emphasize now in that way, but what I mean is, now, after all the crap that he's had to go through so far, now he's come to realize, sometimes I just need to put my head down and keep going and not worry about these people, even when they're within my camp, my camp. Sometimes the attacks are outside. Sometimes they are inside the camp. Anyone have family members who are professional grumblers? Of course you don't. Our families, listen, our families are always pushing us to be the best we can be. Go for it. I believe in you. It's actually pretty rare to have family that supports you like that. But you get, you get, it would be nice. And there's no easier bait to take when it comes to totally losing it than with your own family, right? We almost feel like we have the license for this. Don't take the bait. Moses leads by example. And Hashem heard. The commentary says Moses was humble enough that he would not take the bait. He wouldn't argue on his behalf, but Hashem did. Now listen to me. Isn't that what everyone wants? Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. No one wants to have to be humble and, to, and just, everyone wants God to show up and fight the thing out for you. But a lot of times he has you there to learn how to do something you need to be able to do in your life. So, it doesn't always work that way. And so then we ask this question. Surely, after Miriam and Aaron come at him, then now it's got to go right. Everything's going to go correct for Moses. Smooth sailing from here. Next on the docket, Korach. Next on the docket, the, the spies. Next on the docket, hitting the rock and not going into the promised land. Even Moses. Why? I'll tell you what, because it's real easy to stand right here and talk about it. It's very difficult to go do it. That is to tune all of that out. So, 
I'll ask you this. Is I, I am so frustrated when Christians and religious people say, man, I'm really being, I'm, I'm really being persecuted. Don't ever say that, okay? Don't ever say that. You don't know anything about persecution that would, that, it, because you're having a tough time, because someone was mean to you, because something you wanted to go didn't work out right, man, devil's really got me. He is coming at me. It's not always like that. Is that persecution to be treated badly? To have people talk about you or try to derail you? Is that persecution? It's life. It's life. It's the way life is. But it is absolutely an incredibly dangerous cause of derailing you. Between the sins of gossip and murmuring and complaining and ungratefulness, all of these are ingratitude. All of these are big ones in Judaism. They're all heavily influenced by what happens outside of you. And paying attention to that causes three things to happen. First of all, you'll lose sight of the miracles that God is actually doing in your life. You will lose sight of the fact that God has in some sense provided you a fire by night and a cloud by day. You lose sight of it. Secondly, you succumb to the disease. The disease that's all around you of all the negative people trying to make your world stink like theirs does. And then the next thing you know, you're telling everybody all the negative and now it's just a big mess because you got sucked into it. And then here's a real tricky one. If you are one of these people who cannot keep your focus on a destination, go do what God needs you to do. And I understand that's not that easy. But when you grumble and complain, guess what God might do? He might give you what you want. And you might die with meat in your teeth. You get the, you get the reference, I hope. It's in the Torah portion. They got what they wanted and died with meat in their teeth. So three antidotes from the apostolic scriptures, and we'll end here. Certainly, this is, this is Torah. Favorite of mine is the easy one that I reference all the time, Romans 12. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. That is, for your own sanity and success, if possible, live at peace. There, there will be a time when you have to challenge things. That is inevitable. You have to do that. But that's not your go-to. Moses and, and, and Yeshua, as a great example, didn't, tried very hard. They had to learn, Moses had to learn some lessons to not get sucked into it. But Sometimes you have to engage, but seek like Moses, Hashem, before you re respond in kind. Second one, 1 Peter 4, 9. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Even to the grumblers? I can't grumble back to the grumblers? I started a new note in my, in my phone this week. I have all these different notes, quotes, and things I want to remember and ideas, but I started a new one that I wish I had started 26 years ago. It's called Kelly's Quotes. <laughs> it's all the things that, you know, right now I, I only have one. There have been a lot, but this, is, this was entry number one. You see, here's what happened. I was complaining. Can you believe that? What a hypocrite. In the middle of writing this message, I was complaining. Kelly was on the receiving end as it's pouring into her ears. And, and you know what she said? I hear you complaining, but I can't relate. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. That was her version of that. <laughs> I hear you complaining, but, but, but I, I can't relate. Wasn't that a nice way of saying? <laughs> and you're not, I'm not coming to your party. You're not going to drag me into that. I, I'm not going to let you bring me in. So in essence, in essence, what she told me is, 
I'm going to let that be your problem, which is my favorite. I hear you complaining, but, but I can't relate because I'm pursuing my own path. I'm pursuing a destination toward good and good things. And then Philippians, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Who's great at that? All things without grumbling or disputing. Who's good at it? Huh. That you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. It's so easy to get sucked into it, isn't it? So easy, especially in our world and social media and constant news and everything all over the place. It's so easy to get sucked into it. You have this calling. You should have a destination. If you don't, look for it. Find out. Look. Find out something you really want to do. Sometimes it could be as simple as a daily destination. Your B, it's not really a BHAG, it's not like this huge thing, but how about your daily destination is, I just woke up today, when I get back in this bed, I wanna be further along the road, not back. David Livingston, I can go anywhere as long as it's forward. He was a missionary in Africa. I can go anywhere as long as it's forward. And sometimes God will keep you camped right in the middle of the difficulties and you don't know when the cloud or the fire is going to move, but it will move. But you got to do things without grumbling or disputing and recognize that the others who provide resistance are making you stronger. If you resist their resistance and complaint, you ready? Um, um. Honey, he's lost it. He's finally lost it. Um. You know what that is? He's about to do a meditation. Ohms. O M M S. Ohms. Obstacles make me stronger. I learned that from a great philosopher and teacher that I really admire named Brian Johnson. Ohms. Obstacles make me stronger. Sometimes that's what you got to do, and that's enough to shut out the noise. Ohm. So your example, your, your example of being able to do that will confound and frustrate and anger people even further. I heard Kelly say that. She said, it. I, I, I hear you complaining, but I, but I can't relate. You know what my immediate reaction was? Hey, you're not, supposed to re you're not supposed to react like that. I didn't say it to her, but I was thinking it in my terrible thoughts that control your mind all the time. She's not supposed to treat me like that. You're supposed to feel sorry for me. I come down here on my level and wallow. But then I saw her as she was in this statement as Philippians asks us to be, shining as a light in the world. And I laughed my rear end off at that quote. And it made it into my first Kelly's Quotes journal. Tell somebody that when they complain to you. My Rebbitson taught me this. They'll love it. They'll really appreciate your sensitivity. <laughs> when your coworker says, can you believe what he... <laughs> I hear you complaining, but I can't relate. Ohms. <laughs> It's that messianic synagogue you're going to. They're making you weird. <laughs> the portion this week is called Baha Alotcha. When you light the lamps, your life is a lamp, my friend, a mission-focused, destination-seeking, 
person who acknowledges, accepts, and moves past challenges in life and presses on toward the mark without complaining to shine a tremendously bright light in this world. Don't hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. Light the lamps. Get lit. Shabbat shalom.